Welcome to another episode of Mom Focus. We are glad you joined us today, this Sunday. I know that Sundays are very busy for most of you. Thank you so much for joining us this day and we appreciate your presence. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Mom Focus is a humble online initiative to help young mothers in their journey of motherhood, where we share our experiences, struggles, joys together. As many of you know, we have a session every month, a teaching on topics that are relevant to motherhood and to parenting. And today we have a very, very important topic on parenting teenagers. And we have a very special person to teach that to us. I will be introducing her later to you. Now we will start the session with a word of prayer. I ask Mrs. Betty John Curry to start with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful opportunity you have given us to sit before your word. Thank you, Lord, for this platform and for enabling so many to join today. Thank you, Lord, for the ministries of Mom Focus. Thank you for being with us through the uh, various months that have gone before and helping us to learn so many things from your word and from, uh, from the experiences of many, Lord. We bless your holy name and we praise you and worship you for all that you are doing in our lives. We come at this session into your hands, especially pray for Sister Sajida. Lord, we pray that you will enable her, empower her, give all the grace that she needs to share your word openly so that many who have joined may be blessed, Lord, in the coming days. We may bring up our younger generation to the knowledge and favor of your great name, Lord. We commit her, we commit all the other necessary things into your hands, especially the electricity, the internet connections. Lord, we pray that everything will go on smoothly and your name will be glorified through the session. Lord, pray for those who are praying, for those who are singing, and for uh, especially for Sister Sajida as she answers the questions at the end. We pray for your blessing upon every detail, Lord. We commit ourselves to you. Pray for Sharon, who is leading the session, Lord. Give her the grace that she needs to. We commit everything and offer this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now we'll start with the song. I request Sister Godsey Ebi from Kochi to lead us in singing.
Thank you, Godsey, for this wonderful song. Yes, indeed, God holds our tomorrow. He holds our hand. And what confidence and joy that brings to us as children of God. Today, we have a very important topic that was uh, requested many times by parents, and that is parenting teenagers. If you ask me, or most of us would agree, that in parenting, probably the most difficult uh, time is when our children are teenagers, and therefore I understand that we have received so many requests to address this topic on Mom Focus. And so today we have a very special person to uh, teach us. Let me introduce the speaker for the day, Mrs. Ch Sajida Chako or Sajida Varghese. Mrs. Sajida Chako started her career as an engineer and worked for almost a decade in that role. She left her corporate job in 2009 and since then has been serving the Lord in ministry in different capacities. She has been involved in Bible teaching, in mentoring, and conducting seminars in many parts of the world. Meanwhile, she also got trained as a psychotherapist, specializing in marriage and family therapy from the USA. She's also a certified trauma therapist, a play therapist for children, and a certified international school counselor and a premarital counselor. She's currently working as a psychotherapist, helping people with all kinds of mental health issues, She's also teaching as faculty for postgraduate courses related to counseling and family life. Mrs. Sachita is married to Brother Manoj for almost 20 years now, and they have two boys, 18 and 10. They are currently based in China. I've had the blessed privilege to be her student and be trained under her. The wealth of knowledge and experience that Sachita ma'am has is unmatched and unparalleled, not just her teaching, but her life has been a great influence to me. So I'm very, very grateful to God and very happy to have her with us today. Sajida ma'am, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being with us today. We look forward to this session. For those of you who may have questions related to this topic, you can send the questions to me on the chat box and she will be answering our questions at the end of her talk. So now over to Mrs. Sajida Chak. Thank you, Sharon. It is indeed a privilege to come here and share with all of you. <clears throat> so just in advance, in case, just please pray for my Wi-Fi. It is a bit unstable, but in case if I get disconnected at any point of time, I'll reconnect uh, using my 5G. So I uh, just have to wait patiently for a second, okay? Yeah, but I hope it won't uh, happen. Okay, I'll also share my screen uh, as we start. Okay, it's... Visible, right? Yeah. Sharon, you can see my screen. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So thank you once again and happy to have many people join uh, today in our session. Okay. It's, it's indeed a difficult topic. Yeah. It's so difficult to do such short webinars. I don't know whether I'll do justice to the topic in, in an hour. Uh, recently, I did one full day workshop on adolescence and I felt still it was not enough. <laughs> so how much will I cover in uh, one hour? I am not sure about that, but we will do what we can. Okay. So getting into the topic, uh, teenagers, you all know it. And English, and in English, we come to the teenage term based on the number. Till 12, we don't say teenage, right? Because the 13, the teen starts at 13, right? So 13 to 19, we call it as uh, teenage years. But I don't think that there is a magic with the number 13. And also in other languages, there is no teen attached to it. So we can't say that it is 13 to 19. So for our general understanding, any time since puberty, we can consider them as a teenager. And so many changes happen in this period, right? External physical changes, internal biological changes, neurological changes in the brain, cognitive changes in the way we think, and even social changes in the way they connect to others. So, so many changes happen during this period of time. And there are changes that are happening in the fundamental circuits of the brain, okay, how the brain is wired and functioning during this adolescent period and that is very different from the childhood period. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of brain changes that are happening during this period and these brain changes 
bring drastic changes in their behaviors compared to their childhood behaviors. Now, in the beginning of our time together, I want to focus on some of these specific behavioral changes that you will see during this adolescent stage. Okay. And to go into the first one, the first one I would call it is novelty seeking or seeking new things. Novelty seeking is about the inner motivation to try something new. It emerges from our increase to drive for rewards in the circuit of our brain. The brain is longing for increased rewards. So basically we want to try new and feel good about it. And that makes them feel better and more engaged in life. And this novelty is so much rewarding for adolescents. And the thing is that often we see these behaviors negatively. Why? You were doing dressing up like this. Why all of a sudden you have a problem? Right? And they were eating in a certain way. Why you have change? Uh, you used to keep the cap in this direction. Why you want to keep it in the backward direction now? Right? Earlier, you used to comb your hair in the proper way. Why do you want to put your hair like this now? So a lot of new experiences and we see that as something negative, isn't it? Culturally, we usually see it that way. But what I'm trying to say is that novelty seeking is something that is coming from the brain changes. And uh, it has certain adaptive functions. Think about this. Uh, your teenager grew up and he's 18 now. And he got admission in college and he needs to move to a new location. What if your child, okay, son or daughter, is not ready to experience something new? Is that okay for you? Not okay, right? See, for a child who's not ready to experience that new thing, he or she will be clinging on to mama sari or skirt all the time, even when they need to go to college, right? And that's not okay for us. But one year before that, two years before that, three years before that, when they try something new, we say, not okay. And suddenly when they are 18, we expect them to be okay with the new things. You understand the struggle that our children and parents are going through? So this is where we understand that it is an adaptive thing that is there in them so that they are prepared to experience new things in life. And if they don't do that, it is going to affect their life in the future. For example, they will not move out of home. They will be holding on to daddy mama. Or they will not move to a new place. They will not seek a new partner out there. They will not seek new friendships out there. So this novelty seeking, I personally believe, it is part of the inbuilt God-given nature. So that we grow, we go out to fill the earth and be fruitful in our life. It's part of that changes that are happening. That's why it's happening in the adolescent stage. Of course, to try new things, there will be some risk taking. Novelty with risk taking serves the same adaptive purpose. As mentioned earlier, it's a time of the life when the young separate from the comfort and safety of their parents in order to explore the world and move towards their independence. So that can happen only if they are ready to take risk. Young adults or teenagers who don't take risk, they will suffer later. So we will see these kind of behaviors, the risk-taking behaviors, the new, new things-seeking behaviors in adolescents. And these are intentionally there for a purpose. And this is needed if they have to be successful later in their life. Of course, that creates some challenges. I understand even though it's adaptive, it's not easy. It creates a lot of challenge for parenting. Yes, the sensation seeking and the risk taking, which overemphasize the newness and the thrill and downplay the risk, may result in dangerous behaviors and injury. Okay, that's a struggle that we have in parenting. But it's not just a challenge alone. It has its own upside as well. They are being open to change. They are able to live passionately. Uh, there is a drive to design new ways of doing things. Okay. All this while eating what mama cooked. Now they have a desire to try new things. Right. All this while they have their own bedroom. Now they are open to try living with a roommate. So that, that drive to try new things is coming from that. So what I'm trying to say, novelty seeking, there is a challenge associated with that. 
but there is also a positive side connected to this. And the second behavior that I wanted to touch is called as social engagement or increased interaction with peers. You all know it, teenage parents know it very well, right? We can see that the kids push away from adults during adolescence and they begin to associate much more with peers. Associating with peers during this time is vital for their future survival. Now, again, going back to the same example, they are eating, they went out to the college, okay, suppose they have this, okay, they are fine with the new novelty seeking behavior, but what if they don't have this increased uh, social engagement trial? They will not have any friends in their university. Or what if they don't have the drive to connect with others? They are not going to have a future partner. Right? Or what if when they are at their workplace, they will not be able to work together with their colleagues. That increased social engagement drive during the adolescent stage is again another adaptive function for their emergence of adulthood. It enhances peer connectedness and it creates new relationships, new friendships. As I said again, it has its own challenge. The downside or the challenge is that when they are only surrounded with other teenagers and there are not other adults to speak into their life, it could lead to some unnecessary dangerous stuff out there, right? Uh, but it has its own positive side also that the sub new supportive relationships will help them. And what research has proven is that people who have more good supportive relationships, they are the predictors of well-being, longevity and happiness in life. And people who cut off from other people or isolate themselves from others, it really affects their well-being. So it is very, very important that that increased social drive is necessary at this period of time. Now, moving to the third behavior that I want to touch base, it is called emotion, increased emotional intensity. It's known as emotional spark. Again, um, let me, let me, I don't know how many of you know about this, but there is a part inside our brain, uh, which is called the amygdala. You don't have to worry about the name. Basically, the part of the brain which is engaging with the emotional aspects of life. Okay. And this emotional center of our brain is very sensitive to sex hormones. And what happens during adolescence? There is an increased level of sex hormones in, the, in our children, right? And when the sex hormones level increase, what happens is this emotional area of the brain is highly sensitive. It, it's like sensitive in the sense if it's um, thinking of more like an antenna, it starts picking up signals more, right? Earlier, if it was only picking up 10 signals, now it's picking up 100 signals. So what affects them emotionally is more. So there is an increased emotional sensitivity and that is happening because that emotional part of the brain has become very sensitive due to the increase in the level of the sex hormones in the body. Okay. Now that is why our teenagers, you will find them very emotionally up and down, very volatile. We will see that, okay? So it's not just the one reason, okay, there will be the social pressure, many other factors like increased um, self-awareness. So many of these factors play a role in that emotional intensity being high for our teenagers. Again, there is a challenge. What's the challenge? Intense emotion make it very difficult for us parents to predict things. I don't know what is going to happen to him. Will he be okay with it? Is he going to be sad? Is he? I don't know when he's moody. When is he going to be reactive? So it creates a challenge for us parents when we see these up and down behavior of our children. But the good side of it is that it is what is giving them that energy to life, to feel more, to understand things more. And that is what is really helpful. You, you sit with a teenager and you watch a movie and you compare it with watching a movie with another adult. You will see the difference of that emotional intensity. They will feel things more, okay? Or even something sad, okay? You take them to a very sad situation. You will feel that they feel it really more. 
Okay, it's not just the excitement, even the sad things or the fearful things, they feel it more. So they are very sensitive to emotions. But the good side is that even the excitement, the zeal, the exuberance of life is there for them uh, because of that emotional energy that is there inside them. Okay, so I touched upon three behaviors. The fourth one that I want to talk to you is the creative exploration. See, adolescence is the time for the development of abstract intelligence. Now, you may be wondering what is the difference between the novelty seeking and the creative exploration. See, novelty seeking is more about the uh, desire for new things. But creative exploration has something to do with our intelligence, our cognitive capacity. The abstract thinking and concrete thinking are two different stuff, two processes, okay? In, in, when they are children, it is more of concrete thinking. Okay, suppose we have to teach them one plus one. What do we do? We put one animal and then we put another animal and we'll say one plus one. How many animals are there? Two animals. So that is why. Why is that? Because they need something tangible and real to understand things. But for the teenagers, they don't need that. They can process things in an abstract way. They can think about that theory, that processes, that patterns, that theoretical concepts. And they are able to make connections and see patterns. And that is what we call as abstract thinking. And during adolescence, there is a remarkable uh, growth in the abstract intelligence. Now, how is this connected is because, because of this increase in the abstract intelligence, there is a lot of creativity that is going on in them. The things that they used to do, they find it as boring. They want to uh, innovate new things, do things differently. And, and not only about uh, things, even with concepts. For example, um, when they are children, what do we do? We draw the picture to them. This is David and attacking Goliath and God is there for us and God loves you. We told all these things to them. But now when they become Adolescents, they start thinking about who God is, what God is, what is salvation, how it affects my life. My parents say God loves me, but I don't understand how God loves me. So this abstract level of thinking comes to them. That is why the children, we thought my child was very, very interested in the in spiritual stuff. My child was coming to Sunday school and he, he, he already baptized or he already committed his life. But suddenly he's no more coming to church. Why? Because they started thinking on their own. And they, they, they want to understand the concepts and make it sense to them rather than just learning by heart what my parents have told them. And if it is not making sense to them, it is very difficult for them to accept that. So now here comes the challenge because of this creative exploration. There is a chance of identity crisis. There is a chance of increased conflict with parents. Earlier, daddy said, this is broccoli means this is broccoli. Now it doesn't look like properly, they will start questioning them. So there will be chances of arguments with the parents because they are thinking on their own. And this increased intelligence is a good thing. We don't have to see it as all bad, but it creates parenting challenges. Okay. But the good side is that they're able to live a full life, they think on their own, make things on their own, understand on their own, question the status quo. This there is a good side to it. Now, I touched upon four basic things that happen during the stage of adolescence. Let's put together these four main behavioral aspects. It's very important. It sounds simple, but this is the foundation to understand the stage of adolescence. Looking at the four aspects, the emotional spark, which is the internal sensations that are more intense during adolescence. And it's there for a purpose to create meaning and vitality throughout their lives. And if there is no spark, they don't get the push to move forward. The social engagement, these are needed for the important connections that they make with others that support their journeys uh, with meaningful, mutually rewarding relationships. The third one, novelty, how they seek out and create new experiences, stimulating their senses, their thinking, their feeling in new and challenging ways. Creative exploration, which is a conceptual thinking, abstract reasoning, so that uh, they are able to see the world through new lenses. Now, putting this is a summary of the life of an adolescent. As you can see me highlighting that uh, letters in red, when you put together, what does it look like? That is the essence of adolescence, right? 
And it's not something I don't want to claim that as my own. I read about the essence of adolescence from a famous neuropsychiatrist called Dr. Dan Siegel, somebody whom I, I really respect in this field. And he's the one who talks about the essence of adolescence. And I love that. And uh, this is something that we really need to understand as we parent our children. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I know we write adolescent, S-C-E-N-T, but I like to put it this way, adolescence, right? Adolescence, this is the essence of this time. And on, it, on the passing by, I just want to mention that, in fact, God wanted all of us to have these four aspects. When we move from adolescence to adulthood, we were supposed to carry forward all these four aspects, like the, the excitement, the exuberance, that, and the in, desire to try new things, and the desire to look out for creative, innovative things and connect with more people. But unfortunately, what happened is during this adolescent stage, in many families, this is shunted. No, why can't you continue what we used to do? Why do you want to try something all of a sudden? Why do you want to take this risk? And we are not ready many times to allow our children to do something different and new or risky. Right? It's our fear. And because of that, this essence of adolescence, which is supposed to be there even as an, in the adulthood, is many times not there. And these four essences plus our adult reasoning capacity is what is making a good full adult, I would say. And unless, un, uh, unfortunately, because these four aspects are not encouraged in many people during their teenage stage, we have a lot of boring adults around us. That's a reality, okay? People don't know how to enjoy. People don't know how to have humor. People don't know how to try different things. Super rigid people, you see. Why? The essence is lost somewhere. And God wanted us to live with this essence, right? Our God is a creative God. And, and we are losing it somewhere on the way. And let's not allow it to be lost in our children. Okay, now, uh, what I'm trying to say is that these four aspects, plus sexual changes, plus physical changes, this is what happens during the adolescent stage. Now, think about this. Your child had the same body, but after a few months during this puberty, suddenly they feel differently about this body. Earlier, they used to play with their girlfriends, girl, girl as friends or boy as friends. Suddenly, now they are playing with the same person. They are having feelings, right? And they are having different way of experience. And what is happening to our children? It is as good as our adolescent is awakening as a stranger in a familiar land. And they are struggling. And nobody is helping them to understand you changed from childhood. You are no more in the childhood. You are in a different stage known as adolescent period. And as parents, many times, we want to still see them as our little baby. And we want them to continue the same childish behaviors. Okay. And what that's put our children in a very, very difficult place. In the ancient cultures, there was something known as a rite of passage. Okay, if you know it, when a girl gets her periods or when a boy sh shows signs of manhood, change in voice or the hair or the body hair or something, they celebrated it. They celebrated the transition. But nowadays, what happened is our modern culture becoming so sophisticated. We eradicated many things that were celebrated by our ancient people. I felt with the lack of all this knowledge itself, they knew what better to do. They, they knew it. And our children, teenagers, they feel differently. They think differently. Their body is different. Their mind is different. Their, everything is different. But nobody is recognizing that. And they are struggling. I know as parents, this is a parenting uh, session. Our parents are struggling. But what we need to understand is our children are struggling. Yes, parents are struggling. Our children are also struggling. Right? That is the truth. And we need to understand. Until we understand that, we won't be able to really parent them properly. 
that is why i have to go to that part the first thing okay in many parts of india in many parts of jewish culture and mexican culture and all i still see them celebrating this uh, transition and i i i would advocate for that we need to recognize that things are changing your your life is different what can we do differently as a family here after kind of thing that change needs to be recognized now i am not saying and advertising i know many of your parents maybe like your aunt and i so raised up you are like what are you talking my child want to do all these risky behaviors you are saying that this is all okay uh, kind of you have tons of questions to me i know that i am not saying that um, every creativity you just say yes every new thing you just say yes that's not what i am talking about how we can set boundaries how we can provide proper structure and environment so that this essence is not removed but at the same time we can guide them or lead them in the right direction so protecting one aspect at the same time doing something else that when it comes together is where the teenage parenting becomes more effective and if we adults fight against these fundamental features of adolescence it's like fighting against the natural push of a waterfall think about a waterfall okay it's coming up from the mountain okay from the rock and it's falling down no matter how much you try to push that or stop that from falling down it will find its new pathways to come out right it is the same thing that happens with our teenagers no matter how much we try to stop our teenagers from uh, fulfilling these four behavioral aspects in their life it will find a new way to come out and if we don't give the right good channels for this essence to come out it will find unnecessary new channels to come out and this is where our parenting responsibility is that making sure that this waterfall is flowing through the right channel right anyway it will come out whether you allow it or not but if you want it in the right way this is where our role comes in right and it, in many families i know that this waterfall comes out as a rebellion and we see that as a rebellion right it's because that's the way it wants to push out and uh, sometimes this rebellion is not against the parents and teachers even though we perceive it that way it is against their own childhood self because this th there is a push from within to come out and emerge out as this new adult that he or she is becoming right so we talked about the four essence behaviors and it's important to allow these four essence behaviors in their life now we move to the parenting side okay so i gave you the part one of the talk okay. we move to the second now if you ask me okay you told me about this what do we do i have to be honest with you i don't have a one size fits all solution okay do x y z your child is okay your uh, how home is okay i don't have that solution okay but i can tell you one word and i tell this in almost all adolescent sessions that i take the key word is relationship okay the key word is relationship i'll tell you why in many homes we are struggling with our teenagers we are focusing on the behaviors and we are not focusing on the relationship okay we are focusing on the academics we are not focusing on the relationship okay for example you want your teenager to sleep at 10 and you fight about it but you are not concerned how the relationship is affected in the conflict regarding the sleeping time or you want your child to do this neat exam or that je exam or that entrance exam and you are concerned about that thing or the academics or the grade but you are and i'm not saying you're not concerned but the priority is less focus is less on that connected it's the relationship the key word to parent our children is the relationship okay now can i i have too many things to talk about how to do this relationship with our children but for the time sake i'll just touch few important things which i feel is very important you may have a different list but just from my perspective i'll put few points out there this striving for novelty as i said okay causes a friction in many homes they used to dress properly to church earlier 
Now they don't. They want hoodies earlier. They used to wear formal dress. Or your child is no more, daughter is no more interested in proper chuti that she wants the mini skirt or anything of that sort. They want to try new, new things. And if you are focusing too much on these new changes and trying to stop it without taking care of the relationship, it is not going to work. It's not going to work. That is something. What is our focus is the key here. And the first suggestion for maintaining a good relationship with the teenager is be available to them. Oh, you must be wondering, is this the biggest thing you want to tell us? Yes. These are the simple things that we ignore in our daily life. Simple things. You don't need a big, you know, big neurological stuff and all to come and tell you. Be available with our children. Spend time with them. Keep communication channels open. Okay. Do you know their world? Do you know what they like? Do you know what their favorite foods are? Do you know what their games are? Do you know what kind of song they like? How much time do we openly spend time with them at in discussions and conversations and connect to them? Do we find opportunities for playful moments with them? Humor, laughter, uh, whenever possible. Let me tell you the presence matters. The presence. Being present with the person is not about to just check on the checklist. Did you study today? Did you go for tuition today? Did you take shower today? No. Being present means you are just being open to whatever is in front of you, whatever is available in front of you. Presence involves being aware of what is happening as it is happening. Yeah, just being present with your child. The child is irritated, just being with this irritated child, not just when the child is happy. This presence of yours with an open mind, knowing what is happening inside you and curious to know what is happening in my child and just being open to that environment. That is the key of being available. And are we taking time to be available with our children, just to know them, just to love them, just to be with them, just to enjoy them. We are all most often, many parents, there may be exceptions, spending time with our children with an agenda. I want to talk this to them, I want to correct this to them, you know, with an agenda. No, absolutely no agenda. It's just focusing on our connectedness and our relationship. And when we start building on that relationship, you will start seeing the change in their behaviors. See the priority I'm saying? If you're focusing on their behaviors and not focusing on the relationship, you are going to have a hard time. But if you let go of those behavior focus for some time and focus on building the relationship by being available with your children, you're going to start seeing the difference. It may have to cost something. It may have to cost even your, your expectations. You wanted A plus for your child. You wanted to be known as my son is a doctor or engineer or did this exam or that thing. Who had to change here? Is it the child or the parent? Right? We need to ask these questions. Whose expectations are we pushing on this child? Are we open to this child as God has created this child? Okay, so for example, the child is meeting with a lot of peers. Instead of seeing it as an interrogation time, whom did you meet, where did you go, how long were you, where did you, see, instead of that, just spend more time. First of all, the more time you spend with your child, the less time they spend with their peers, okay. Secondly, the more time you talk to them, you will be able to get a lot of information about their friends from them. Okay, you you play with them, you say that Gina did this, Alex did this, you know that we were planning to go for this thing and we had this dream that was nice. It will come out of them, out of that time that you spent with them rather than you questioning them like an interrogation room in the police room. You just be with them. You will know what is happening in their life. It has to come out of that natural engagement with our child. Yeah. Okay. The second thing what I want to talk is about being affectionate. Okay. Uh, express love and affection in words and in actions. Know your teen's love. I, I believe there must have been a session uh, already about love language here. Right. So know your teen's love language. 
and start expressing love in their love language. If your child is somebody who flourish on words of affirmation, give more affirmation. If your child flourishes with touch, hugs and kisses and pats or massage or anything, give more of that. Show love to them in their love language, not in your love language, in their love language. And even in the midst of new behaviors or risky behaviors or uh, wrong choices that they make, our children must feel that they are loved. This is the difficult part. I'm repeating that. It's so easy to love our children when they are nice and obedient. How are we showing our love to our children when they are not going in the right way that you are expecting? Almost all parents will tell me now, of course, we love our kid. What do you think? Are we not spending all this money and sending them to this course and that coaching and uh, doing all these things for our children? I believe you. I believe you. I don't question any parents here. We parents love our children. But I have to always also tell you from the other side, many of our children don't feel loved. You get the difference what I'm saying? Yes, you parents are loving them, but at the receiving side, many of our children are not feeling loved. So what is happening in between? Now, if I talk to many of the teenagers, some of them will tell me like this. I don't believe, I, if I say, them, no, your parents love you, please don't do this, don't get away from the home like this. They'll say, sorry, Mrs. Ma'am, I don't believe you. My dad don't love me. The only thing he does to me is that he just shouts at me all the time. Right? That's what they see. Or he will say that my mom thinks always about my rep her reputation through me passing this exam. I don't think she really cares about me. Right? As I said, I don't question your love. The challenge here is, is your child feeling loved? I'll ask you something. Suppose there is a secret camera that I keep in your house, okay? And I record your facial expressions, your body posture, your tone of talk, your volume, your words, uh, everything when you communicate with your teenager. And I'm a third party who doesn't know you and your child. My question for you to reflect is, will I see love in that communication? The thing is that I don't know you, I don't know your child, I don't know anything about your family. If I look at that camera, what will I see? How is your facial expression when you talk to your child? How is your body posture? I'm repeating this. How is your volume? How is your tone? Right? And does it make them feel loved? Or does it make them feel, I want to run away from this person? Harsh, accusatory words must be removed completely from our vocabulary. If you truly want to parent in the way God wants us to parent. Without experiencing the love of parents, the teenager is far more likely to succumb to the evil of drugs or sex or violence or whatever it is. In my opinion, nothing is more important than the parent learning how to effectively meet the emotional need of love of your teenager. There is nothing more important than the parent learning how to meet the need of love of my child. Whatever stage your child is in and however the behavior is, I know some of your teenagers may be so grumpy, closing the door, don't want to talk and angry all the time, anything. But I'll tell you one thing, deep inside every child, whether teenager or not, they have this desire to feel loved, connected, accepted and nurtured by their parents. Every child has this desire in them. And when that need is met, to be connected, to be accepted, and to be nurtured by my parent, the teenager feels loved. When the teen does not feel connected, accepted, nurtured by the parent, his inner emotional tank is empty. And that emptiness is going to affect the behavior of your child. 
now i don't want that's another session all together hmm? how to meet the fill the emotional tank of the child I'm not going there but if the child's emotional tank is empty it's going to reflect in the child's behaviors okay and to move to the third point that i want to tell you is parenting with empathy i know we get hear these words a lot these days empathy right empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from their frame of reference right understanding from their point of view now think about your child is so grumpy or distressed as parents are we able to show empathy to our child are we connecting to them using empathy are we understanding their pain and disappointment and connect at the emotional level before even giving them a suggestion or solution to the problem and this is all the more important as i talked about love when the situation is something that you don't like or the choice that the teen has made is something against your family values i'll tell you an example suppose your family value is that teenagers don't date until they are adults okay suppose that's your family uh, value and decision what if your child disobeyed you and started dating with their boyfriend okay and then the child had a breakup with his boyfriend and the child is sitting in the room and crying about it think about it how will you connect with your child using empathy here and as far as i understand many of the parents you know what you're going to do bombard into the room and say what have you done right nonsense you brought shame to our family and you disobeyed us you you violated what the lord has taught you and all kinds of lecture will come out right all kinds of lecture will come out and i'll tell you something different i know you will freak out at me by hearing this if you could connect your child at that moment and truly try to understand their pain what are they going through what is their emotion they are hurt why because their boyfriend dumped him dumped her right so she is hurt can you truly understand the pain and say that i know it's really tough when somebody dumps you it's not easy i know for many parents this is a tough thing to do especially that's why i said especially when they do something against our values can you truly empathize with them now the question i know what is in your head are you saying that we should just agree and say okay it's okay kind of thing for anything that she they choose no this is where the wisdom has to come in at this moment your child is hurting what they need and how you can connect with this child is only through understanding their pain anything else that you do at this point is going to take your child away from you anything else and then where is the teaching moment when things calm down maybe two days later maybe a week later sit down with your child and say that let's talk about this dating concept let's talk about sexual purity let's talk about what the lord wants from us of course there is a place for teaching there is a place to connect with her not knowing the difference of when to do what is causing that disconnect in many families and the more we not understand their struggle their pain their emotion they don't want to do anything with us why my dad doesn't understand me my father doesn't understand me he only knows how to lecture me right this is what the child say i know there are times when you don't understand when you really don't understand what is happening with my child show curiosity the bible says we shouldn't judge but how many times we are so quick to judge our own children right it's so quick 
I have had many, many young clients come to me and say that my mom called me a prostitute. My mom called me this. My mom said I'm a slut just because I dated a guy. We are so quick to judge our children. We are so quick to call names on our children. Instead of using that opportunity to connect with our child and develop the relationship with them. And because we are missing those opportunities, children are going away from us. They are misbehaving more and more. I'm not saying that they do I love everything. I'm repeating that. There is a place for everything. There is a time for everything. This is where that godly wisdom has to be practiced. And now, again, coming back to the curiosity. Stay curious if you really don't understand your child at all. Okay, instead of coming to conclusion about their external behavior, stay curious. Oh, I see that you like to dress in a different way these days. I'm really curious. Instead of straight away telling that, what is this nonsense that you're doing? Who taught you all these things to dress this way? Stay curious and open. Curiosity without judgment is probably is going to help us understand about their inner life and also even help the children to understand about their inner life. See, many times when our teenagers make certain choices, they took it impulsively. Even they don't know why they do this. So just open, be open and curious and say, hmm, interesting, new style. Yeah, how, what made you think that this is a good way of dressing up? What is that you like about this? Interesting. Be open, be curious, change the way we talk to our teenagers. If you're coming as an autocratic person and always saying no, no, no and judging them for everything, you are not going to get your teenagers in the way God wants them to. I'm very straight on this. Okay? And just be open and say that. I wonder what makes you think that's a good choice for you. Just be curious. Just be open. And probably in that process, they will realize that. I don't know why I do this. Yeah? Stay curious. And that is something I would say to connect with our children. Instead of saying, why did you do that? When they do some mistakes. For example, the same girlfriend at Sandra. Why did you do that? Say that I'm so curious. How did you connect? And what you what made you to think that it is a good thing to start at this point? Start from there with an open mind rather than coming with a negative judgmental talk in the beginning. Right? I know we, I don't have much time, so I'll just talk one more point, uh, which is the last point that I want to talk to you, which is emotional safety. I know, I don't know how many of you think about this point. Emotional safety means they feel safe at the emotional level. Okay, I know in many of our homes, the physical safety is there. Many of our homes, if not all, uh, physical safety is there. But emotionally safe means feeling safe to express emotions. Feeling safe of being accepted as who they are. Feeling safe internally. It is the feeling, it is a feeling, but something that you experience physically in your body. That with this person or with these people or in this place, I don't have to feel scared to be me. That is what we call as emotional safety. Now, when the, when you are talking with your child, if the child is feeling internally triggered and disturbed, I don't feel comfortable to be with my mama at this point. That means the child is not feeling emotionally safe with you. Okay? And in many homes... The sad thing is that our children are not feeling emotionally safe with us. There may be physical safety. You would say, I'm not hitting him. I'm not attacking him. We are not abusing him. But they are not feeling emotionally safe. To be emotionally a safe parent, we need to regulate ourselves. We need to work on ourselves so that we don't come out as a threat to our child. If we come out as fast, large, and loud, you know what happens? Suddenly, their alarm system is triggered. You know, we all have an alarm system in our brain, which alarms us of danger that is around. And I repeat that for three words, fast, large, and loud. It triggers our alarm system to send something as a threat. 
Now, when our alarm system is triggered, you know what are the main two options that comes out? Either fight or flight. Fight means, okay, you are a threat. I am ready to fight with you. And if you're seeing a teenager who is always ready to fight with you, the first question, we focus on the teenager, right? We think, what is his problem? He don't know how to talk respectfully with the parents. And this is what we are thinking. But the question before that, probably we should ask ourselves, am I coming out as a threat to my child? Okay. What is fast, large, loud means? Fast means, I told you to do that, prepare for the exam and I told you not to watch TV anymore and this is what you're doing. Blah, 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 blah. Just commands and lectures just coming out. Non-stop, overflow, flooded things coming out. Fast. Okay. What is large means? Large means, um, I know we, uh, it sounds weird to me when I picture this, it's more like this bear when it's ready to attack, you know, stand up and then the shoulder stretched kind of thing. And in many homes, the parent comes to the teenager with that kind of a body posture. Okay, not in an inviting, accepting body posture, but in a ready to attack body posture. Okay, and, and the third one is the loud. Let me tell you, if anybody comes to you with a loud voice, immediately we will be like threatened internally. All of us. Something is not right here. And so when we are fast, when we are large, when we are loved with our children, we are triggering their alarm system. And either your teenager will fight with you or they will go away from you for escape. And they will get out and slam the door and get into the room. They don't want to do it with you. Instead, what we should do? Just the opposite of all of this. Learn to speak slowly. One instruction at a time. Don't come as a large person who is here to attack him or her. Come in a more accepting way, in a hugging or extending loving way. Instead of love, learn to speak softly. Learn to speak softly with our children. And for this, we have to regulate ourselves. And we have to model in front of them how to calm ourselves. For example, your child did something and you are really angry. There is absolutely nothing wrong in being angry. But in that anger, are we coming out as fast, large and loud? Is the question. Then it's not going to be helpful. Then what do we do is that we say, I'm angry now. If I talk now, I will disrespect you now. So let me calm myself down and I'll come back and talk to you. Okay, you take a break, you take deep breaths or you take a few minutes to pray or you go and take a shower or you take something to calm yourself down. When you know that I can deal with my child not being fast, large and loved, come back and reconnect with your child on that matter. Right. And many parents would say, how can we do that in the midst of an argument? Yes, that's where the self work comes in. My question to you, all of us is that if we don't know how to self-control ourselves and self-regulate ourselves, how do we expect this emerging brain which is still being shaped to know how to regulate themselves? We as adults don't know how to self-control. Okay? And whenever our feelings come, we just blurt out things and attack on things. How do we expect them to know them? They have to learn self-control and self-regulation through our example. When they see that every time my mom gets angry, she's taking a few deep breaths and she's taking time to pray and just calm herself down. Over a time, your child will start doing the same thing. Maybe when they are alone, you'll start doing that. Get the point? We are modeling how to handle emotions. For our children. And, and being fast, loud and large, we are not giving emotional safety to our children. Now, we are not perfect parents. Now, I teach you all these things. I have to be very honest with you. There are times when I am fast, large and loud with my children. It's not that I don't have the knowledge, but we are imperfect people. Sometimes it happens. But at least one thing and I can tell you that I have decided in my heart that I don't want to do this. And when it happens, I admit that 
I did something wrong. And then what I do is that I look for that opportunity to do a do-over. Now, what is this do-over? Okay. An opportunity to do things differently. I'll take you an example of a uh, dirty shoes, for example. Okay. Your child came from a soccer game and had walked into the house with the dirty shoes and the dirty shoes on the carpet. As a mom, you just come in. How many times I have to tell you that you don't walk into the house with the dirty shoes and I just mopped it today and I just vacuumed it today. You it's a fast, 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 loud and loud. Right? Now, after a while, after all the blurting out, I came to my senses. Oh, I was fast, loud and loud. It didn't help in any way. Come to the, come back to a child and say that. I'm sorry. I was too disrespectful with my loud yelling to you. And that's not good for our relationship. I will, can you give me a chance to do it over? And your first time you say this, your child is going to be surprised. What happened to my mom? Right? Just say that. Just give me a chance to do this thing differently. Right? Just go back to the front door again. Walk into the house and say that. Look at the shoes and say that. Oh, Jasmine, these shoes really make me mad. Can you please not put the, bring the dirty shoes inside anymore? Mama just cleaned it today and I don't want it to be repeated anymore. Okay, you said that in a slow, calm voice, the same thing what you want to communicate. And then wait for how your child will respond. So what are you doing here? You're modeling to your child that we are imperfect people, but we show grace to one another even when we make mistakes. As your mom, I make mistakes. And I want you to show grace to me. And I know you make mistakes and I want to show that grace to you. And we are practicing the unconditional love and grace in our family, even in the midst of mistakes. Hug your child even when they are making that terrible mistake out there. Say that I love you even though I don't like what you did. Right? Just express that love and grace to them. Otherwise, can you hear me? Yeah, we missed you for Hello. a minute, I think. Yeah, we missed you for a okay. few. Yeah, back. Seconds. Okay. So you heard till the two hours. So come back and two hours. We are modeling the Christ unconditional love and grace to our children when we practice two hours. And in many homes, what actually is happening is that we are actually modeling conditional love. In many homes, we are modeling conditional love, which means our child will get a hug if they get good marks. Our child will get a um, hug if they are you. doing... I think your voice is going on. Okay. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, we'll, we will be done with you. So what I'm trying to say is that in many homes, what we are actually modeling to our children is conditional love. You will get a hug from me, you will feel loved by me when you are all doing good. And no wonder many adults are becoming people pleasers. You know, to get acceptance, I had to be all nice. Because in my home, I was accepted, I was loved, I was kissed, I was hugged only when everything was according to my mom's standard. Can we practice unconditional love of God to our children at all times? Can we show that grace to them at all times? That is the key to build this relationship. And to do that, of course, we have to do a lot of self-regulation on us. I know we will fail, but practice, practice, practice. And you will fail 100 times, do 100 times, do hours. I failed my son. Let's do it differently. Even if your child did mistake, if you think in any part of that big trouble that you had with your teenager, you made a mistake, ask for an opportunity to do a do-over. And so the primary work that we are doing is, I know many of you came with thinking that, how can I easily fix my teenager, right? But I want to tell you, we being available, we being affectionate, we being empathetic, we being emotionally safe to our children, that is the essence of teenage parenting. Yeah. When we can practice this truly, we can parent them. If you're practicing conditional stuff with them, it's not going to help. And 
I want to say, just finish with one verse here. The Bible says children are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. Do you just take the arrows and just aim, just send it aimlessly? Or you handle it carefully? We need to handle it with so much care how we aim these arrows so that we have better outcome. Parenting is something intentional that we have to do. And I have to tell you that parenting our children through that process, God is doing his process in us. He is making us to be people in God's image. How do we learn patience and gentleness and uh, long suffering and all those things? It is through this journey that we are going through. And nothing is wasted. Even through this parenting journey, God is doing his work in us. If only we are open to what the Lord is doing in us. And we are ready to do all those duos and be humble in front of our children. Things will do a difference. Thank you. So that's what I want to share today. God bless you all. Thank you so much for that wonderful session. I'm sure that all of us are greatly benefited and blessed by it. Thank you, Sajida ma'am, especially for sharing your heart with us. I've already received a lot of questions. So can we directly go to the Q&A if it's okay with you? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So I'll read one by one, I guess. So the first question is, I'm very concerned about certain things about my teenage son. But my husband always says, I was also like that, so he'll be okay. So as husband and wife, we struggle to be on the same page. What to do? Yeah, just go back to what I said. I think focus on the relationship with your child, I would say, rather than worrying too much about the behavior. If you can really build the relationship with your child, and whenever you feel you want to have some conversations about some of the behaviors, have open conversations without coming with a judgment in the beginning, negative stance in the beginning. I'm curious about this. See, for me, uh, sex is like this, but I, I wonder what you are thinking about it. And this is what Bible says, but I, I, I'm curious curious to know how you are processing it anything anything of that sort come with the curiosity to understand how they are processing don't be judgmental focus on the relationship behaviors will follow it's not the behaviors that are going to change first focus on the relationship first thank you another question is on the social engagement aspect my do daughter suddenly became isolated as a teenager I don't find interest in her to be socially engaged at all, though we encourage her, her for that. Isn't this contrary to teenage behavior? Yeah, it is possible. You will see this happening at times. It could be because they are... Uh, self-esteem is low or they are so self-aware that they feel they won't be accepted by other peers or something. Uh, multiple things I would say is that one, find your child's love language and see how you can uh, show more love to your child, intentionally more love. And also if you could intentionally and directly connect with other families of the same age to children connect as families so that your child has some opportunities available to connect with children of the same age, safe families. Hmm? Uh, if you could do that, just try that out. See, as a parent, if you try, you go connect, you go connect, you're going to connect, she may have internal issues. So if you could also facilitate, let's go out, let's go meet this family, let's have dinner, let's invite this family. You don't have to say that I'm trying to hook you both up kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You, you, Engage socially more with other families so that your child has opportunities. And at the same time, more love and stay curious about what's happening. Uh, just connect with your child more. Things will slowly start changing. Okay, thank you. I think that's a really good mm. thing we can do. There's mm. another person similar, but a different issue. My son became very lazy as a teenager. He's not interested to do anything. How to help him? It's about laziness. Mm. Stay curious. Don't they call him name. Don't call him name. You are a lazy but Get up and do something kind of thing. Please don't come up with such judgments. That's what watch out our language. Yeah? Just love him even if he is lazy. Okay. 
and just be with him and find fun. Okay, I'm so curious that these days you are really not interested to go out. Yeah, just come up with open conversations and see what happens. Yeah, it's okay. okay. I don't feel like I don't feel like. Okay, uh, I'm feeling lonely or. I wouldn't want to be sitting like this. It's so boring to me. I don't know whether you feel bored about this sitting alone like this the whole time, and have general conversations. Or okay, I'm, I can play something with you. Would you be interested? Or can we go out for shopping and find how we can show affection? The four points I said: affection, being available, and showing empathy to them. I don't find it anything interesting. I know that must be really tough that you don't find it interesting to do anything at this point. Would you be interested for us to brainstorm? Like, what are some things that you could do? And stay curious and have open discussions. Okay. Another question is: How can we proceed with a teen who takes it granted or and take advantage of our love and empathy? I, I think that's probably our perspective. Yeah. that the child is taking advantage of it uh is continue to love i would say the love when when you say empathy is that see there is something called as authoritative parenting versus authoritarian parenting if you think that i only love my child and i don't correct my child or i don't teach my child then that's a different thing so we should also find time to talk about what do you think about this these are the biblical principles this is what we believe and do we have time for those kind of things as well okay and how do you set boundaries okay your child wanted um, some kind of expensive shoes for a time you show empathy and say that i know you really wanted that cristiano cristiano ronaldo shoes kind of thing i know i know you really wanted it you wanted to show off just like your friends isn't it yeah i would also have loved it if i got an opportunity to buy that thing but it's tough when you don't get it isn't it it's disappointing i want to get you my son just getting a big hug then you don't have to agree to everything when i say empathy and love it doesn't mean agreement it just means that you understand what is in their heart that's all mm -hmm. Wow, oh, that's a really good perspective. Another question is how to control anger when you see a teenager making the same mistake again and again. Continue to work on your self-regulation. Yeah, more opportunities for you. Say that I am feeling very angry, but I don't want to be harsh with you. I'll come back and talk to you later. Come back and talk to me that I don't like. seeing this being repeated this is not okay and just say that how should we agree on this matter so that the next time this is being repeated or how should we handle it have see there is something called collaborative problem solving which means with your teenager if something is being repeated it means it's not time to lecture anymore it's time to solve the problem so you need to sit down with your teenager and say we have a problem at hand and let's think about it collaboratively how we solve this problem right and ask them for their suggestions see this is making me angry this is something that i don't like how can you help me how do we solve this problem mm -hmm. how do we solve this problem so if same thing is repeated it means time to do collaborative problem solving it's not about you one way lecturing keep on lecturing it's not going to work okay i think that could, yeah the collaborative problem solving might be the answer yeah that i think that's really yes. insightful solution there are a few more questions what is your opinion on sleepovers for teenagers especially if children of both genders are going to be in the house it depends on the culture because i know people are here from multiple uh, countries it depends on the culture in your culture if it is not okay you don't have to agree with that um if you ask me personally i'll be very honest i will not do a love a sleepover where both genders are there okay uh, yeah but if there are many people and if it's in a public place and if there are other adults involved in that place or in a 
other parents involved. We, it's a case by case we have to see. But if yeah. you're suspecting something will not be safe for your child, it's better not to agree on to that. You can say that. I really feel you. You are mad at me for not letting you go. I understand my sweetheart. I know, I know, I know. But mama is not feeling comfortable to let you go. But I love you so much. You are still my sweet girl. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Another question is, how to balance love and discipline for a teenager? How can a parent enforce boundaries without being overbearing? I'm thinking about that question is a bit more. How can you enforce boundaries without overbearing? I don't know what exactly they are thinking. Maybe the teenager is yeah. feeling that the parent is too strict, something like that, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, okay. If that's a, that's a time to review ourselves. Are we being too strict or something? Honestly, I'll tell you, my child, my teenage son thinks that I'm too overprotective, okay? I have to be honest, <laughs> okay? So they can think what they want to think. I am not going to change that. So there are times I examine myself, I am being too overprotective. If I feel that way, I'm willing to change. But there are times when I feel, no, I'm not being overprotective. They, they feel that way. It's their feeling. Yeah, I understand it's the feeling. But now, until you are an adult, I'm not going to allow you to do something which I'm not really okay. Which is something I feel that it is too difficult for you or too risky for you. But at the same time, don't say no for everything. If it is something not going to, um, I would say if it is not illegal or immoral, it's okay to allow them to try some risky behaviors. It's okay. And so, sometimes we need to allow them to fail in certain things. Don't protect them from failures, okay? Fail in their exams, fail in trying this new bungee jumping and fail in trying this new segue, fail in trying this new whatever, whatever cycle uh, episodes. Let them try, let them fall down, sometimes fracture their legs. I know it's painful for the parent, but don't protect too much from everything. Don't stop on everything. Unless it is not going to create a big issue about life and death or some police case or something, Allow certain things and let them experience the natural consequences of their choices. And sometimes one or two such negative consequences will teach them the lesson. Wow. Yes, that's true. There is a follow-up question. What if my teenager is not willing for collaborative problem solving if he or she is not willing for any discussion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just continue. Just continue loving and being available to them. Just being there for them. That's all. But if it is something that is affecting the bigger family, you might have to take a call. I know you are not interested to for this discussion, uh, but in this house, since it is affecting the other family members, this is not allowed. That is where sometimes you just have to take the parent card and take the call. Okay. If it is really affecting other children or the functioning of the entire family, we might have to take a call. Okay. Yeah. Next question is, my 17-year-old daughter closes her bedroom door and stays like that any time we try to give her a suggestion or say no to something. She then communicates only through WhatsApp. Till we budge to her demands, she won't come out. She even misses schools like misses school like this. We are struggling how to handle this. It is difficult, but I feel that Somewhere that connection is not there, I feel. She is trying to get things done by being there and forcing things. Mm. You don't have a yes. quick solution. I'm thinking what it would be a better way to handle this. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy if she's going to be there and not ready to come out. Uh, how do how does she eat? You don't have to give food into her over to her room. You don't have to. Or um, if she says if she takes comes out just for the food, uh, I don't know what, how do you the rest of the things work out. But I would say don't budge, no matter what. Like if she's missing the school for one month, let her, let her, because so she knows that if I persist for a while, my parent would agree on this. Right. So I would say that I love you, but I I can't let this happen to my child. 
So mm-hmm. sometimes we are afraid of the uh, reputation that we have or how will I answer to the society, the neighborhood, the relatives and all. We have to let go of that and say that. No, I'm not going to budge this because this is not right. Not okay. right. And just mm-hmm. keep texting her and saying that I love too much to argue with you. Keep sending her, I love you, my daughter. I'm ready to talk with you when you're ready, but I can't let this happen because I love you too much to let this happen. And if she misses yeah. one school year, let it be, let it be. Somewhere you, we have to break the cycle and break this pattern. Yes. So I'm going to club two questions next. One is, can we allow teenage kids for social media like Instagram, etc.? The other one is, is it okay to buy a mobile phone to the child? who's a teenager at home when they are in school. So it's Instagram and mobile phone. Hmm? Question is, why do they need it? Is the question mobile phone? If as a parent, you feel the need for them to like they are going out for tuition and there is no way to contact them when they are out or something like that. Maybe you have giving them a mobile phone for practical safe reasons maybe, but uh, other than that, uh, you don't need. So you can say things like, okay, you can take the phone when you go for the tuition. The rest of the time, it should be on the dining table here. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, instead of bringing it out as rules, come up with, before even you give that, come up with the uh, understanding, okay? Why do we need this? I'm curious to know why you think that this is necessary at this point. And, okay, this is my need. Okay, we are ready to satisfy this need. But for anything outside of that, we don't want to do that. We don't want to give you the phone. Okay. And at the time, as part of the collaborative problem solving, you again say, so what do we do if we find that you are taking the phone without permission other than the agreed times? Okay. Come up with, let the child come up with the consequences instead of you imposing the consequences. Mm. Okay. Say that, okay, then you don't give me phone for the next two weeks, then implement it. Okay, uh, this week we had something in my home. Uh, we have been asking uh, my young son, younger son not to talk too loudly and raise voice against us. And we came up with an agreement that what should I ask him, what should we do the next time you raise your voice? And he said, you can, because he love, loves to go on his cycle to school. So he said, you can take away my cycle. For this whole week, he didn't get his cycle. So every morning he will ask me, Please, please, can you let me take my bicycle today? Can you please let me take my I would say, what did we agree? You agreed on the consequences. You raised the voice. Let's implement this consequence here. Okay, you're not allowed for this one full week. So the same way, no matter whatever that is agreed with your child, implement it. Implement mm-hmm. it and bring out consequences when they violate it. Yeah, mm-hmm. if they are misusing or abusing the phone, agree ahead of time that it will be taken away and it won't be given to them for the next two months or three months. And just no matter how much they plead with you, just stick with that. I love you so much, but we agreed on something and this is something that will be implemented. They need to know that we are on real serious business here. Okay, I think. What about the Instagram, social media? Can teenagers be on them? What is your opinion? It's again a cultural, uh, people would differ, I would say, on that answer. It is not a strict yes or no. Uh, I am personally not comfortable. They don't need to be there on this Instagram. But just because they are on Instagram, I don't see a big problem also. So just talk to them. What are they following up and what is happening? And can you keep it open like so that we can see your Instagram. Maybe we will allow Instagram if you give us access kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So just have discussion and negotiate and come to a solution uh, rather than being too adamant or rigid about it. And different families would take a different call on this setting. That's right. Another question is, I am a working mother. My husband is also busy with work. How can I spend time with my child because... I'm finding it very difficult to find time. I will say an answer to you, but you won't like it. It means that your parenting job is a less priority for you than your other career. Okay. I was a working mother as an engineer. And there came a point where I didn't have time at all with my older son at that time. 
I didn't have to think twice about quitting my job. Because for me, that this is a sacred responsibility that the Lord has given me. And I'm not ready to compromise on that. You won't believe that my income came down to probably 120th in our family just because I quit the job. There are times we financially struggled because I took that drastic decision. But I had to pay a cost. But I took my parenting responsibility seriously there. And if you husband and wife are super busy with your work and you want your teenagers to flourish and grow, whom do you expect to do the parenting job then? Wow, that's a really important answer. Yeah. And I think, ma'am, we I'm thank not... God that you quit your engineering because God has made you a blessing in so many ways, not just your children, but to many others. Yeah. Yeah, that is, I think that's a really, really important answer for all of us to consider. I have one last question. Yeah. How to discipline and correct a 15-year-old son who becomes very rebellious the more we try to discipline? Maybe start with the love and affection part. I told you, see, I the starting point of our session today, if you're focusing on the behaviors, the rebellion will come out more. Focus on the relationship. Just park it. I'm not saying that you have to agree with his behaviors. Just park it aside for a while. Intentionally connect to the heart of this child. Yeah. You yes. don't have to allow, agree with this. Okay. Yeah. Um, focus on the relationship. Focus on the relationship with this child. For the time being, don't keep argue, argue, argue on the behaviors. And the child will wonder what happened to my dad or mom. They are not even questioning me about this. It's not that you are agreeing to it. But you're choosing, I would say, choose your battles right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, there is one more question. Um, I think you answered it partially already. But this question is, what if the father and mother cannot agree on the parenting style or the mode of discipline in the house, how to go about a situation where both think, both of them are thinking differently. Anything you can add on, ma'am, to your previous answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say agree on the principles. Sit with your partner at some point, spouse, and can we talk about the basic principles of life? Like, do we both agree that we want this child to be walking in godly ways? Do we both agree that we want to see a good character in our child? So uh, talk about those basic things rather than the implementation level. And then agree on that and maybe you both have the freedom to implement it differently. Okay. For example, mm -hmm. if a wife is about giving consequences, you implement that if you cannot agree on it. And the husband is about some other way of disciplining, let him do that. Uh, both of you work it out that way, but at least agree on the principles. See if you yes. can have an open conversation. And if you both cannot even agree on that and have a proper discussion, before we work on the parenting, you need marriage counseling. Yeah, that could be, that could be an important thing to consider as well. Yes. Okay. So anyway, we have run out of time and I tried to answer <laughs> all the, I mean, ask all the questions that I got. Thank you so much, ma'am. I praise God for giving you much wisdom, teachers, as well as answer all these questions. Three of the participants have asked if they can know how to contact you personally for help. Uh, uh, you can give my email address. They can email it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, ma'am, is it okay if I put your email address in the chat, or is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, that's fine. Yeah. The same one that I use, right? Yeah. The therapy one you use, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If I have too many requests, honestly, my number of requests that I take is very less uh, because too many requests are coming. But based on my yes. bandwidth, whomever I can take, I'll do. Yeah. Right. The rest yes. I'm just giving out to other people who can take. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, ma'am, uh, thank you so much uh, once again. And thank you all uh, for staying with us till this time, though, you know, we know that you all have busy lives and busy days. We really thank you for your time. 
So quickly, I would like to share with you about our next month's meeting. So the next month meeting is going to be a slightly different kind of session that have been requested many times, but we were debating whether you know we should put it as a separate meeting or part of Mount Focus. But finally, we are having it on Mount Focus on November nineteenth. This is on welcoming motherhood, prenatal and postnatal care. So it might look like a very narrow audience, but those who are on this journey or those who can help others are all free to join the session welcoming motherhood prenatal and postnatal care dr anita epen a gynecologist based out of cotem in kerala will be speaking to us so please join and pass this information to others as well now if you want to reach us you can whatsapp on this number 9447795836 this is sheba sam's number you can also email us at momfocus2020 at gmail.com. Uh, uh, we will reply to your emails. Now, as most of you know, we have a YouTube channel, Mom Focus. All our previous sessions as well as this session will be uploaded on the YouTube channel. So you can go to the channel and subscribe and also get benefited with all the content that is put there. We are also on Facebook and Instagram. If any of you are active on social media, Mom Focus on Facebook. Mom Focus 2020 on Instagram. If you have any counseling needs, you can WhatsApp this number. This is my number, 8978306903. You will be directed to a Christian counselor if you reach out to this number. So thank you so much for staying with us. And um, I hope the session blessed you. We will close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this time that you gave us to spend together with uh, Sajida Ma'am. Thank you, Lord, for the immense wisdom that she could share with us today, Lord. As we are all in different stages of our parenting journey, Lord, we commit our lives to you and our children to you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be wise, to make the right decisions at the right time, as we heard today, to love our children, to spend time with our children, to be uh, empathetic to our children, and also to be emotionally safe places for our children, Lord, so that they will grow up to be well-functioning adults who fulfill all your purposes and plans for their life. Thank you, Lord, for this session, Lord. Help us to be doers and not just hearers. We commit all of us to your care till we meet again. May your blessing abide on us. We ask and pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much.